Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes and welcome to Mom's Favorites Books My Mother Loved, my memorial uh, reading series uh, for my mother. So we're still in the midst of the A Staircase in Surrey uh, pentalogy. So this is the pseudo cover, thumbnail, something or other, uh, for the uh, for the published edition that I read of this particular book, The Madonna of the Astrolab, the thing about this one, this one and the last one, is that we don't actually own the copies at home, so I wasn't able to have the copies in my hand. Um, and, however, to, again, as the last one of these videos that I did to maintain consistency across the whole series, we're going to put up for the bulk of this the actual cover, uh, the, the cover, rather, of uh, the rest of the series from the first two, and will be the cover from the last one. Uh, now, this is a book that was initially published in 77, if I'm not misremembering. Uh, the correct numbers will be in the description below, as they usually are. Um, and so, we've been following... Duncan Patello's uh, arc in Oxford throughout the series. We had the first book, which was the the gaudy, the class reunion. The second book, which was a flashback to his first year in undergrad at this fictional college at Oxford. Uh, the last book was the initial couple of months of his time as a new dawn teacher thingy at this fictional college, the Madonna of the Astrolab picks up more or less where that left off. There is a large section of flashback in the middle, um, and this book basically runs along... Uh, th there are sort of a couple of major lines of, of, of issues uh, plot-wise in this book. There is the issue of Duncan Patella's wife, because we're introduced in the very first book to the idea that he is divorced, and his ex-wife returns, and uh, we discover in this book that his ex-wife is, in fact, the young woman Penny, who was brought up in his flashback in the last book. Uh, she, in the second book, rather, she had seemed very much incidental in that second book, that his friend Martin Fish had had a terrible, terrible breakup, and Patello had, Duncan had become determined to set him up with this girl that uh, he'd run across named Penny, and uh, he had, in the process, despite believing determinedly that he was trying to set fish up with this girl, it turned out that he really had developed a crush on her, and uh, there was a bunch of and there was sort of a bit of back and forth on that, but then we come back to it in this book, and it turns out that, <clears throat> as was indicated by Fish in the second book, she's a flirt. But more than a flirt, she's somebody who doesn't seem to really care about the other people around her, that she is a user, and that she is not a particularly faithful romantic partner. Uh, we particularly see this during a flashback to uh, just a year or two into their marriage when they are traveling in Italy, and she cheats on Duncan with a young Italian man solely for the purpose of taunting another gentleman who was on the boat with them. Uh, they are taking a boat trip with two men who are both gay and are not in a relationship with each other, uh, because one suspects that neither of them would actually cope well in a relationship with the other. Uh, because oddly enough, uh, uh, gay people do not, are not in fact all entirely copacetic with each other and do not all fit together like two puzzle pieces just because they're gay. Thank you, Buffy the Vampire Slayer Season 7. Um, I, I have a bitter resentment about Willow's girlfriend in Season 7 of Buffy because 
Kennedy is not just incredibly irritating. They they set Willow up with Kennedy in in a thing that to me was totally they're both lesbians, so obviously they have to be together, which is dopey. But anyways, neither here nor there. Um, so going back to the book, they're on the boat with these two men, and one of them is uh, sort of having a a thing for this young Italian man that, you know, he's very pleasant to look at for him. And so Penny, in what Patello reads as very much a taunt, decides when the older gay gentleman goes swimming, decides to have sex on the roof of the boat with this Italian guy in a way that, again, reads to Duncan as her taunting this gay man. Um, and, you know, he had picked up the binocular, he had been on a walk with some other people and had picked up binoculars, looked down at the boat and seen his wife, uh, clearly having sex on the roof and basically just walked away from the whole thing, which I think is wholly understandable. Uh, but she comes back and he winds up in a sort of an awkward position emotionally because at the start of the book he's told that oh yes she'll be back in town and staying with me by another woman but and at the time he had thought that it wasn't that important it didn't matter to him they had been divorced years ago it's all over whatever and then he finds out that she's perhaps pushing to have an affair with a couple of the students at the university twin brothers in fact both of them and he starts to get a little upset and, and overset about the whole thing. In the meantime, there's also an issue about a tower that has reached a state of disrepair such that it is falling down. And there is concern about whether and how to fund the tower. Should they fund it? Should they just let it fall down? Should they take it down carefully? You know, the sorts of things that will come up if you have a tower that might be falling apart on you. Uh, but they also... Uh, they also, in, I believe it was the previous book, had gone on a quick walk to check on the contents of that tower to see what was in it, what was going on, if there was anything exciting being kept in there. And we discover in this book that a painting, which they retroactively entitle Madonna of the Astrolabe, hence the title, hey, um, that there is a painting by Piero della Francesca, who, would, if you don't know who that is, he is a particularly well-known, uh, very early Renaissance, late medieval, kind of on the borderline, like, you know, 1400s Italian painter uh, that he's very, very well known for, uh, for his paintings. Um, never really particularly my thing. I mean... I could see the I, I could see the attraction in them. They're sort of uh, slightly pre uh, what's the term I'm looking for? They, the Piero della Francesco it comes a little bit before you get um, more significant usages of of perspective in painting. He still has a certain degree of that of that flatness and and visual style of the medieval period, but the humanist qualities that begin to appear in the Renaissance, these, uh, you know, man is the measure of all things sort of ideas, uh, this, uh, this certain qualities and aspects of realism to the painting have begun to seriously show up in his work, and uh, it's, it's, it's an important thing. Um, so, at least if I'm recalling correctly, it's been many, many years, and I just don't recall being particularly interested in Della Francesco. But anyways, so, um, the thing is, though, that they find this painting that they believe definitively appears to be by, uh, pardon the beeping, that's my timer, uh, running out of battery, um, 
they find they find this painting that appears to be in the style of and that they think it may very well be by this particularly famous painter and there's a whole thing about whether to keep it whether to sell it if they do keep it where should it be kept this is a painting that is immensely valuable in monetary terms so you can't just you know stick it on a wall somewhere because uh, it is small enough for somebody to make off with it. This isn't the Sistine Chapel ceiling. It's a single, easy-to-carry rectangle. And indeed, uh, somebody walks off with it partway through the book, and there's a period in which they don't even know who has it or where it is. And there's a lot of panic and kerfuffle because, of course, if they had sold it immediately, at least then they would have had the money and wouldn't be in trouble for this and indeed when they get it back at the end of the book uh in a four page final chapter it is said that uh you know basically by the end of the day it was up for auction on the market because they just they couldn't keep it they couldn't maintain it and they couldn't keep it from being stolen and it just wasn't worth it uh so you have you have these lines ongoing in in the course of events. You have uh, you have the discussion of his issues about Penny. You have the discussion of the issues about uh, the painting. There is a play that takes up a significant portion of of the things because. Duncan Patello has very clearly, between the first book and this one, developed kind of a relationship with one of the undergraduates by the name of Nicholas Junk, uh, Junkin. And Nicholas Junkin is kind of a very, very typical undergrad that he has... He has some scholarly type things that he's super interested in, in his case, plays, and he attaches himself to Duncan because Duncan is a playwright. Uh, but he also isn't a devoted scholar. He's interested in plays, but he's not interested particularly in scholarship. He'll fake it well, periodically, but, but he mostly fakes it in service of, you know doing more playwright stuff. So, uh, Marlowe's Tamburlaine, which I know basically nothing about because I never studied Marlowe in school, um, because I wasn't an English major. Um, Marlowe's Tamburlaine is, it, they, they put on half of the play because, as with so many plays, there's a part one and a part two, and they're tremendously long, and it's supposed to be a good, exciting, rip-roaring thing. Uh, they go to a great deal of effort involving pyrotechnics and all kinds of stuff. And it forms a kind of a backdrop upon which uh, about the first half of the book sort of goes by, that, that there are effects caused by the play, things that happened because the play was going on that would not have otherwise happened, but the play itself is fundamentally just a backdrop, a stuff-is-happening-around-us sort of thing. Um, interestingly, of course, we really get almost nothing of Duncan teaching, which I suppose makes sense on one hand because teaching is incredibly dull uh, if you're not actually interested in what you're teaching, uh, in what is being taught, rather. Uh, but... It is a flaw in this book, I feel ever so slightly, that it makes it sound a little bit like Duncan just hangs around and has meetings when people decide to get up to some plotting. Because in this book, as in other book, as in the other books in the series, there appears to be a great deal of plotting that goes on. Um, financial plotting, interpersonal plotting... And he's not always wholly aware of what's going on because, as he says in the previous book, no one ever tells anyone anything at this school. Uh, so the theme in the first book of everyone expecting you to know stuff and you not knowing it because they're not telling you, it has continued through the series. 
Anyways, that's everything that I have to say about this book. So, uh, I guess that's all, and I'll see you all next week.